Welcome to Module 6, Evidence of a Beginning of the Universe from the Law of Entropy. This is the sixth module in a 12-module series entitled God and Modern Physics. It is presented by Father Robert J. Spitzer of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, and it is based on his recently released book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. Welcome to the Magis Center of Reason and Faith series, God and Modern Physics. I'm Father Robert Spitzer, and we've been talking about the evidence for the existence of a creator, supernatural design, the evidence for God from contemporary physics, particularly contemporary astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, specifically, we've been talking about evidence from the law of entropy for a beginning of the universe, even for the beginning of a bouncing universe. And uh, we need to just complete that evidence for just a second. And we've seen already two militating factors against an infinitely bouncing universe. Uh, the first is that if you had an infinitely bouncing universe, then the um, uh, CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation, would have to be an infinite times... Uh, greater than the starlight in the universe, which would be virtually nothing. And that is clearly not the case because the CMB radiation right now is only 100 times larger than starlight. So it's uh, very likely that uh, you could only have 100 bounces if you had any bounces at all. A and secondly, we saw that uh, uh, Tolman's limit that uh, if the universe uh, gave rise to greater and greater radiation and then pressure, and then the pressure produced greater cycles, that as we go backward in time from our finite cycle right now, you would have to get to an infinitely small radius with an infinitely small cycle, which would have to constitute a beginning of the bounces. So even in a bouncing universe scenario, entropy is already dictating uh, that there would have to be uh, a beginning of the universe. There's a third argument which is really important. It really goes back to a physicist, Roger Penrose, who calculated the odds of our low entropy universe occurring by pure chance. In other words, when the universe exploded out of the Big Bang, the odds of it being a very high entropy universe, that is to say, a very disordered universe, disorganized universe, with very little useful energy, uh, the odds of that occurring would be much, much higher than the odds of the low entropy universe that we actually have. When Penrose was finished with his calculation, what he discovered was that the odds against, the odds against our low entropy universe occurring is 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1 against. That's a double exponent. Let me explain that number a little bit more. That's like a 10, and then in the exponent, you have a 1 with 123 zeros after it in the exponent. So the exponent reads trillion, 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 in other words, the odds of the universe occurring with a low entropy are exceedingly, exceedingly low. And that means that it is exceedingly, exceedingly improbable. Let me give you an analogy. That would be like saying to a monkey, monkey? Type out the entire corpus of Shakespeare by random tapping of the keys and get it done in two weeks. I'll be back. The monkey, of course, begins his project just randomly tapping on the keys, taking the occasional lunch break. And then eventually you come back into the room and you notice a perfect manuscript. Macbeth, Hamlet, you can't believe it. Richard III, it's done perfectly. You say to yourself, this is highly improbable. Or perhaps an intelligent person with a very, very good knowledge of Shakespeare helped the monkey out that indeed this was not done by random chance. Well, that's the odds, basically, of our universe coming out to have the low entropy that it does by pure chance. Now, here's the only thing you have to remember, that every previous bounce would entail 
that the universe have even lower entropy still, which is even more improbable. And the reason for that is every time the universe bounces, there's an enormous increase in entropy. Every time the universe collapses, there's an enormous increase in entropy. So if at our bounce today, the odds against that are 10 to the 10 to the 123 to 1, imagine in a previous bounce where the entropy is even lower, where the improbability is even greater, and then another previous bounce, and another previous bounce, become more improbable and more improbable. Really? So now the monkey's going to do the entire corpus of Shakespeare and Victor Hugo all by pure chance and just keep increasing the... I doubt that very seriously. And it really does put a considerable chink into the very possibility of any bounces whatsoever. But an infinite number of bounces, as Sean Carroll, a very famous cosmologist, once observed, why that would be like infinite fine-tuning for no apparent reason, an infinitely improbable event occurring for no apparent reason. Or perhaps, as we'll see, maybe there was an apparent reason. Maybe the universe's conditions were fine-tuned beyond belief at the very creation itself. But save that for later. My point is, the low entropy of our universe at the Big Bang makes any previous bounce, the improbability of even lower entropy at any previous bounce, highly, 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 highly improbable. And for that reason, there would probably have to be a beginning of the bounces. Barring no other explanation, these three reasons, the CMB radi radiation compared to the starlight in the universe, Tolman's limits leading to an infinitely small radius with an infinitely small cycle, a beginning, and now, of course, the improbability of having a previous bounce with even lower entropy, which is even more improbable, they all lead to a single conclusion. There very likely was a beginning of the bounces. Indeed, it is very likely that our Big Bang is the first bounce, and there was no previous bounce at all. So that's the first set of evidence, the law of entropy. But now let's go to our diagram again of our triangle, and we can see a very similar conclusion coming out of a very different set of evidence that we'll call space-time geometry. Now let's just recall for just a moment, before we begin the three different pieces of evidence that come from space-time geometry, just recall for a second again that space-time is not an empty void. Space-time is like a field. It warps, it vibrates, it compresses with the mass density of energy in it. In other words, space-time is a highly dynamic field that's interacting with mass energy. And notice then that we can tell from the configuration of the geometry, we can actually tell whether there's a phenomenon that we'll call a singularity. You can actually prove that there was a singularity. Now, before um, uh, the uh, um, inflationary universe was discovered, uh, two uh, physicists, uh, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, got together and actually did develop a, a, a proof for a singularity. And that proof, unfortunately, had five conditions. And the third condition was that there not be any energy that would interact negatively or, or in a repulsive way uh, with mass energy. Now, today we think very much that there is a preponderance of dark energy in the universe. And remember, dark energy is very, very repulsive. And so it seemed like the third condition of the Hawking-Penrose proof was violated. And because of that, it seemed like, well, a singularity really wasn't necessary for our universe. But then came along uh, two other physicists who would later be joined by a third physicist, Arvind Borda and Alexander Vilenkin, and they were later joined uh, by Alan Guth. But the main thing is, in 1993, all of that changed because uh, Borda and Vilenkin actually discovered a proof for a singularity 
with inflationary conditions being accounted for, and we will be talking about that and other proof from space-time geometry in the next episodes. To learn more about this series and the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, please visit www.magisreasonfaith.org. That is www.magisreasonfaith.org. You may purchase Father Spitzer's book on this subject, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy, on the website or through Amazon.com.